so, so, so what do you think of it? Oh, I thought it was great. You know, um, it brought back a lot of memories being able to see um, Junior do his thing. And, you know, it reminds me a lot of, um, you know, we all watched The Last Dance with Michael Jordan. And when you walk away, we all were around watching Michael play in those times. But, like, we got kids, a whole different generation that didn't see Michael Jordan play. You just hear the arguments and the conversations. But to see him again in footage and he's sprinting up and down the court and dunking and doing all these amazing things, you recognize how unbelievable his talent was once again. And I think this will do the same with Junior. Um, he's playing in a lot of the same ballparks these guys play in today. You see him roaming Fenway Park, going all over the place, Chicago, Detroit, New York, um, even though New York and Detroit are new stadiums. Uh, he's, he's doing his thing, and I think people are going to really have a great appreciation of him. Yeah, that's a great way to look at it. I, I hadn't thought about that, but you're right. There's, a, there's generations that had not seen just how good he was. Yeah, and I thought also um, it captured really the essence of his, his story, his career, you know, from coming through Seattle all the way back to, I should say, even high school, uh, and then through Seattle, the tough years, the turbulent years in Cincinnati, didn't shy away from them, went into the injuries and all that, and then to return home and then to Cooperstown. So it, it covers the, the full gamut. What do you remember about his – his athletic ability and, and the way he played the game? Well, it, it was something that you hadn't seen from anybody at that point in time. I mean, a guy 6'4", uh, roaming around, doing what he did. His athleticism was amazing. He could have probably played, you know, any sport. He had that kind of a, a body. But my early rec uh, recollection, uh, reckon, my early remembrance of him, I can't get the right word out, I want to say, um, was when he was 17, he came to work out with us in the Kingdom. You know, the number one pick always gets to come work out with the Major League team. And he hopped in the cage and started hitting balls in the second deck in the Kingdom. And we were like, are you kidding me? Who is this kid? And he had marveled me uh, from that day forward. Uh, maybe one of the greatest catches I've seen, and it's not in the documentary, they got some great ones of catch in Detroit with him and Jay Buhner over the fence and the catch in New York and, you know, the Spider-Man catch off of Ruben Sierra. All those are in the documentary. We were playing a game, either his first or second season in Fenway Park, and Wade Boggs was hitting. And I turn around and Junior's standing in right center field. Well, everybody knows Wade doesn't hit a ball in right center. And I'm like, what's he doing? Um, I, you know, right before the pitch, I turn around. I don't have time to wave him. I turn back around, the ball's hit. And sure enough, Boggs hits one in the left center field towards the monster. And Junior is on a dead sprint and leaps into the fence and makes this amazing catch. And I was just like, play wherever you want. Doesn't matter. See, that, that's why I like talking to you, because you, you have stuff that, uh, that people just don't know. Um, can you uh, – that? so obviously that's one of your favorite memories, but – how about September 14th, 1990, junior and senior hit back-to-back -back homers in Anaheim. You saw it in person in the dugout. What do you remember about that moment? Well, I always tell them it doesn't happen if I don't single. I'm as simple as that. I started off the inning. And I always tell them that. But, no, um, uh, senior goes into this story in the documentary. And I, I, I guess about a week or so earlier, he had homered senior, and junior popped up. And that was the first time you actually thought about, hey, father, son, back-to-back -back home runs. And Junior was trying to hit a home run too hard. So when Ken Sr. homers in Anaheim, I'm the first guy in at home plate because he drives me in with the home run. And as we high-five and we're walking back to the dugout, I go, if he hits a home run here, man, we're looking at history. Nobody's ever going to touch this. And by the time we get back to the dugout, boom, he's homered. And if you see the clip at the end, we're all three sitting at the end of the dugout, and that's what we're laughing about because it never dawned on his dad that that might be history, but Junior was always thinking about things like that. Man, man I would imagine you guys talked about that for the, the rest of the game. Because that happened in the first inning. Yeah, you know, and we were like, you got to do it again. <laughs> Back it up. <laughs> um, I, you know, you know um, he had a couple of memorable quotes. He once said, 
Why should I stretch? Does a cheetah stretch before it chases its prey? <laughs> With all its na his natural ability, Harold, uh, was he much for the weight room? You know what? He played everybody so, like, lived up to the whole hype of he's just the natural. He can do anything. Junior would get to the park at, like, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Look, he's 19 years old, really 20, the first two or three years. He couldn't go out. He couldn't do anything. So he'd be at the first one at the ballpark. He'd be there like 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And he'd hit every day, extra hitting. Him and Gene Kleins, it seemed like every day he hit extra. And I'd be like, you're going to burn yourself out. He's 19 or 20 years old. So he worked harder than anybody. But come 4 or 5 o'clock when it was time to stretch, he wouldn't stretch because he's already been there. He's already worked out. And he tried to act like it was just all natural. Hey, I'm just going to go out and just do my thing. And people bought into it like they never saw him work. So if you weren't at the ballpark at 2 o'clock, you didn't see the 150 or 200 extra swings he took every day. And he, he loved it. He just ran with it. Yeah, I can tell. He, he, kind of, uh, he did kind of wrap his round, arms around it for a while there because uh, he would play it up for sure when people talked to him about it. But um, – you once told him that uh, he wasted three years going to high school when he should have already been in the majors. <laughs> so you've kind of told me what you remember about him when you first saw him, but what about the spring training when he showed up and things like that? Well, the first spring training, uh, he came into camp, and I remember Dick Williams immediately wanted him on the club and junior signed in, 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 in uh, June. So he didn't go to spring training with us. But after that workout, Dick was already trying to figure out, how can I get this guy to camp? So he turned 19 that, 18 that November. And then the next year comes a spring training. So by the time he breaks camp, he's 19 the next, the following year when he makes the club, because he went one year to A ball. Then he comes to big league camp at 19. And they even thought then, he's just going to, let's see what this kid can do, because he was moving so quick through the, through the organization. And that first major league spring training, his second professional spring training. And he came to the major league spring training with us. He was the best player. I mean, he was lighting up everybody. And pretty soon, you start putting him in competition against the best players, best pitchers. Okay, let's see if he can hit Eckersley. Okay, let's see what he does off Mike Moore. Okay, let's see. Uh, we're going over to San Francisco. Uh, throw Drebecki at him, a lefty, a tough left hand. He played every game and took on every test. And we went to Las Vegas for the last three days of the spring training. We played the Padres in Vegas, and then you go to Seattle. And he was hitting 500 all spring. And we got there, and it was April Fool's Day. I'll never forget this. And Jim LaFever calls the whole team in and goes, we're going to let Junior know that he made the club, but we're going to act like we're sending him down. An April Fool's prank. Okay, so they call him in. You had a great spring, young man. You hit over 500. You're probably the best player on the club. You deserve it, but you're a little too young right now. We're not ready for that. We're going to send you back. Tears just started. He started bawling. It just broke him down. We felt so bad. And it was like, no, you made the club. You know, but man. man. Actual tears, huh? He was crying. Oh, yeah. Physical tears, man, because he had played his tail off, and he knew it. Hey, this special airs on Father's Day, um, and one more quote from Junior. He, he, he said, my dad would, would have bopped me on the head when I was a kid if I came home bragging about what I did on the field. He only wanted to know how the team did. What does that tell you about seniors' uh, trait and uh, ability as a father? Well, he played with some great teams, and uh... – I, I've been telling a lot of people about this because I've been asking a lot since we had that documentary on MLB Network coming up as well on Sunday. Um, I don't think Griffey Jr. becomes the player he is if he doesn't play with his dad uh, when he's 20. You know, it was his second season. Nobody in the organization could ever touch his swing. You know, that was one mantra across the board. No hitting coach mess with him. And Gene Kleins had played with his dad, knew him well, and Gino became our hitting coach. And they would have a number of conversations. But I never saw anybody get him in the cage and go, okay, hold your hands here. Uh, get them back. Uh, get some time and try a leg kick. Nobody ever did anything like that with Junior. 
and it, he always talked with his dad about hitting, and everything came through there. So now his dad comes to play with him when he's age 20 and would work with him, talk, and he became a great student of the game. And really he went from tremendous talent to now really putting it together. And if you notice from 20 to moving forward, he really took off after that year we played with his dad. You know, I want to ask you about the um, the special again, but there's a lot of people in this special, man. I mean, in and out of baseball too. Like, it was pretty impressive to uh, to read up about what's what people are going to expect and what they're going to see in this special. Um, I mean, Macklemore, Peyton, like so many people from Seattle alone. But um, you know, give me your your overall take of this special when you saw it. I mean. It really came – it seems like it really came together nicely. Probably could have gone 180 minutes instead of just 90. Yeah, I mean, it, it was really impressive. Uh, LeBron James is one of the first voices and, and people you see on there, and he's talking about how when he was a kid and Griffey was playing baseball, it made him, all the kids in the inner city, want to play baseball because of Junior. And I think because of not only the, the, the flair in which he played it, as LeBron says, he made baseball cool. You know, he had the hat on backwards and uh, the earring, and, and he was just an amazing athlete. So you gravitate to that. Uh, and listening to LeBron say it is really impressive. Uh, Bo Jackson's talking about he's the baddest man on the planet. You know, so you got some icons talking about how great Griffey is and is cemented with the video. Um, I go back to where we started this thing. The video and the highlights – uh, of Junior are absolutely incredible. Uh, it just takes you back to the moments and the plays and and all the, the, the things he was involved in on the baseball diamond. It's incredible. All right, two more questions for Harold, because I know that uh, you got to go and I can't monopolize your time, even though I wish I could have you for a lot longer. Um, <laughs> I want to ask you about uh, Griffey's sense of humor. Um, in my experience with him around him in the, in the early 90s at the Kingdom, he was funnier around the cage than he ever was in front of the camera because he seemed always to be guarded about what he said, soft-spoken. But, man, I always thought, man, if I could get him to be himself like the batting cage, Ken Griffey Jr., in front of the camera, it would be great TV, and he never did that. Um, he was a pretty funny guy, though, out off that camera, huh? Oh, he was a character, man. I mean, always was. But he'd be around the batting cage talking more trash. You know, and the other thing he did – we had a guy named Gene Harris. I don't know if you remember Gene Harris, but he came over in the Randy Johnson trade. He was a pitcher. And Gene, one day him and Junior were talking about who can dance better. So we got the whole team in there, the boom box booming, and they're going to this dance off. They're doing break dances and they're doing you name it, anything across the board. And Junior could hang with him. And, it was, uh, and that was it. He would talk about how great he looked and how good he could dance. And that's all we heard for a month. And uh, that was just him. You know, he, he, anything that he felt was good about it, he would continue and just ride it, ride it, ride it. Was the dance off in the, in the clubhouse? Oh, yeah. Yeah, in the middle of the clubhouse, man. You know, <laughs> it, it, was, it was taking you back. If you remember the 90s, they brought out the baggy clothes and everything and went to work. <laughs> awesome, man. All right, one last question. I, I have to ask you about a baseball uh, question. So, your reaction to a, to the possible deal and, and a shorter season, and you know, uh, you know this game better than anyone. What what's your reaction? Well, hopefully we can get this thing done. They need to play. You know, the fear of not playing this year. Um, you're looking at not really playing a baseball game since last September. Um, it, it's it's inexcusable. So we got to try to figure something out. I know both sides are working awful hard uh, to get the guys back on the field. But in the middle of a pandemic, I know people don't want to hear about dollars and when 40 million people are, are unemployed. So you would hope that we're going to get this done um, and get back on the field and be, you know, a beacon of, of change and be able to see that uh, with baseball. But it's important, I think, moving forward for not only the sport, but for our country that uh, if everything's healthy and they're safe and the environment is, is great to play, then we need to play baseball. When you hear of, and this, I promise, is my last one, but when you hear of some of these details and the designated hitter through 2021 and things like that, um, 
uh, are those good things for baseball? Like, could, could they learn from maybe the adjustments they're going to make this season and, and maybe possibly a shorter season in the future instead of 162 games? Well, it's going to be tough to get away from 162 games because of the records. And, you know, we're such a stat-oriented sport. I know the other sports rave on the statistics, but they change. You know, you can't touch a receiver within five yards. Uh, they added a three-point line. Everything changes in all the other sports. Zone defense, no zone. Baseball is pretty consistent with our records and with how many at-bats you're going to have and the distance of a home run, things like that. So I think that uh, has a big part of it. But there will be change. I, I think you have to continue to change and evolve. And back to the other sports, they've continued to evolve and, and really keep that action alive. And so I personally would like to see um, no shifts. I never thought I would say that, but the shift has taken away uh, so much of the offense of the game. And we changed the position of second base. Now we're putting third basemen out there, Moustakas and Muncie and guys like that are playing deep right field and we're calling it second base. So I would like to see something like that. But I do think that with the, the designated hitter in both leagues now, we might be seeing a, 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 a change that will be forever. Uh, they've been wanting to get away from pitchers hitting just from the injury part, and National League clubs have fought it. But it might be where we're at now. Expanded playoffs, I think that's going to be here to stay. Uh, every sport has expanded the playoffs. And if you look at the scenario, you know, Mike Trout, uh, is one is the best player in the game right now. He's been in the playoffs one time in eight years. Had we had an expanded playoffs, he'd have been in there six times already. So you got to have your stars playing at the most important time. So I think that's going to happen. And then the final one might be a destination World Series. Uh, we're like the only sport that can't market your biggest event because we don't know where it's going to be. You know, basketball has different events. Their opening day and their all-star games and they turn them into a big week and different things like that. Football's got a Super Bowl destination. Hockey's got a destination. Baseball's like, well, we're, we're tied up 6-6. Six, six. It may be in Seattle next week or it might be in Cleveland. It could be in Miami. We don't know. And it's hard to follow the sport that way in today's world. So I think I would like to see a destination World Series where somebody's sitting here right now as we are in June and says, you know what, I'm buying – Four tickets to game four in Miami. I'll be there on November 5th. You know, and I, I think it just changes everything. Yeah, I, that's a great, great insight. Great take there for sure. Well, Harold, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you letting me go in overtime with you. And uh, it's always great to hear from you and talk to you. Paul, I love the old school pitchfork, man. <laughs> Takes me back to Craig Reynolds and Bruce Botkey days. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, man. Okay, well, take care of yourself. Thank you now. Appreciate okay. it.